Ranbir, thank you so much. Welcome to the Maestro Online. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So tell us about your musical journey. How did it begin? Was it obvious that you were musical at a young age? Your parents encouraged you. How did it begin? Yes, I think I was. Uh, I grew up in a household where uh, my grandfather used to sing very simple devotional songs, and my uncle, my dad's younger brother, played the tabla, uh, and you know he he was very good, but he was an aeronautical engineer, um, and but the love he had for the tabla, and during his own um, sort of study years and all, he used to have a lot of friends uh, who played sitar and other instruments and he would accompany them. And I saw him uh, play with the sitar player uh, once and that was my sort of beginning kind of thing to say, oh, I, you know, I want to learn that instrument. And that's how sort of I had, and I, I would keep asking him, can you please take me to a, a sitar teacher? And it took a few years, but eventually he he took, took me and the, a local teacher in, this is in where I was growing up in India and in Punjab, uh, the Golden City, uh, sorry, the, the Golden Temple City, Amritsar. And so I started there, uh, Siddhar. But I think the biggest uh, sort of um, influence on, on uh, taking it really more seriously came from uh, Sadhguruji. Sadhguruji is a was the leader of a, a, a Sikh kind of a, a, you could call it a faith a sect called the Namdharis, and he we were part of that. And naturally, you know, we would all uh, pretty much uh, you know say yes to whatever he he asked us to do because he was our guide, like a guru. And he was very much into music and he saw me play a little bit and he, he was so encouraging. And I think as a kid to, to get that encouragement was, wow, you know, I need more of that. So, and, but then straight away he said, oh, uh, you have to go to another city to go to and learn from a, a better teacher. And I was only 15 then, so it was a pretty tough decision. For my grandparents, because my parents were living in uh, in Africa, East Africa, and uh, and I was living, growing up with my grandparents, uh, so I went there for almost one year. As I was in another city, and then he he decided to introduce me to the great maestro, the great sitar maestro Ustad Bilayat Khan, um, and a meeting was arranged, and you know it all. Uh, was quite a, a surreal kind of a thing because uh, for us to imagine to go and you know have have associations with a maestro of that caliber uh, was very tough you know but because of his intervention the maestro agreed to to teach and take us on as students so so Ustad was an extremely respected guru did you feel that he demanded very high standards of you or did you feel the pressure because yeah. because you respected his name so much did you did you feel a feel a, a sense of anxiety about how much you had to deliver i don't think that because you know you you were talking here a tradition which is called the guru shishya uh, tradition where it's almost like uh, you know you living with your guru or, or master musician or like an apprenticeship model and uh, so you just go in that environment and, and you know, and I'm an outsider, I have no idea um, how you practice. You know, for me, it was just a little simple activity. But then in that household, my father is sixth generation musician who have been looked after by the royalties in India. And so they were pretty majestic uh, people. So he of course, uh, had this very special bond and relationship with music. Uh, imagine six generations and an iconic figure who, who changed the course of sitar playing in India. Um, I, being an outsider, it was every little thing was an eye opener. Um, I remember once a, a phone uh, rang and his daughter went and took the phone and said and 
you know, and she is talking to the uh, the secretary to the then Prime Minister of India, the Indira Gandhi, and and the, the the message was, oh, Indira Gandhi would like to talk to uh, Usad Bilat Khan, and I was like sitting there and I said, wow, Indian Prime Minister, you know, is ringing to to talk to him, and this little girl uh, just very quickly said, I'm sorry. Abba, Abba is the name they use for father. He's doing his riyas, his music practice. And could you please ring later? And I just stood there quite, you know, my jaw dropped and I said, wow, music is comes first. And when I later on asked my ustad, I said, you know, Indra Gandhi rang and he says, son, these people come and go. But music is not as much part of me, part of my life. You know, little instances, there are many of those. And I think that we picked up. And the other thing staying in that household was the the meaning of Riyaz. And the word Riyaz is a very special word for the musicians um, of the Indian subcontinent. It has been, there has been studies done on trying to see is the word English word practice, my everyday practice, really come any closer to the concept of Riyaz. And I think it's, yes, in some respects it does, but there's more to that. So the Riyaz takes on almost like this uh, very yogic, very much a relationship which we have to our yoga practice or meditation practice, where it's part of life. And its purpose in life is more than just earning a living um, or, you know, those materialistic gains. So they always talked about two types of benefit, one being the outer, the worldly benefit. Uh, you got fame and you got to know people and, and maybe you got money and all of that. But then there was this other one, which is what's called the hidden benefit. And the hidden benefit was not quite measurable in an outside way, but it was that which was actually enhancing your evolution as a human being. And the, the final evolution which in the Indian practice, even the musical practice, is that one day we evolve to our maximum capacity where we don't anymore have to come into the bodies. You know, we transcend and we go beyond that and merge into our essence, which is the, uh, for musicians, that essence is, is the, the primordial sound, the sound which is the basis of all sound. So is music then, music practice and riyaz, it's about the spiritual soul in the music, which then comes through the mind and works the body, if you Absolutely. see what I mean. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there are Hazrat Inayat Khan, a very famous uh, um, Sufi saint and a musician, wrote in his book the, uh, the uh, mysticism of music and sound. Amazing, phenomenal book. And you know, and he says that he says music is such a meditation practice that it's actually because of the vibration and the effect on your body, because body is vibrating as well. So this reciprocal process of what you can call entrenchment or consonance with that vibration gradually gradually is making you much more finer you know in, in terms of the vibration the way body vibrates. With resonance in your skeleton or or uh, you could call it becomes to purify the our essence and that's what any meditation practice or any thing thing we do for that purpose is trying to do and, and the point that uh, luckily we are doing an activity which is not only entertaining but actually deep down it's, it's doing a magic which, you know, and, and throughout history India has always um, nurtured this to, to, to a very, um, you know, large extent that about how the nada, the sound can take us to that ultimate reality or ultimate goal. Could you talk a little bit more about 
Riaz because that word practice is really important and quite a few people have asked to talk about what practice means for them, how do they practice and for the best musicians very often it's not just mechanical repetition, it's something more than this. Yes. And I think the, the fact that uh, you know, there are different levels of that uh, you know, uh, riaz. At the body level, you of course want your muscles and fingers to be in, in movement and there's a regular sort of thing of keeping that machine you know, oil is, is that how you start so, your pra your yeah, daily practice? You start, you start with something mechanical to get the fingers working, and the so that's standing there. But that, along with that, the the, the 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 essence of that when you are then not doing that, but you are in a in a performance mode. There, of course, all that you did is is in the in the background. But now something else takes over that when the real music begins to happen. And there is a, a, a layer of that which they often talk of, you know, which some, some music musicians would do a 40 day riyaz. Now this 40 day, 40 day principle is embedded within meditation practices, yogic practices, 40 days of an activity where you've given completely to that activity. You know, you're not going out, you're not going there, you are in isolation, but only doing that. And it's a something about this 40 days of of practice musicians doing well start used to say he did 14 hours every day. And that 40 days they would come and talk about their experiences of of very paranormal nature experiences, something which was very mystical, very spiritual that that an, another layer formed in their playing which had such a magic in it that when audiences listened to that they didn't play you know very difficult phrase but something very simple and and people's hair would stand on, on, you know like the effect of that phrase very hard to explain can you yeah. is is there something you do within your uh, daily ritual or your 40 day riyaz that do you have a particular particular way of going from the mechanical getting my fingers mm -hmm. going to the um, I want something to transcend beyond my fingers beyond the mechanical I think it's it's again uh, I don't think musicians are very conscious of that but mm -hmm. the, the fact that their dedication onto that you know we, we all those of us who have actually touched that kind of riyaz, um, kind of a practice where you're doing something, you're doing something and then there's, there's no sense of time anymore and you're floating, you're in a space where, you know, all that is happening is, is self-hypnosis, you know, you're like a, in, in that kind of a, a space. And I think it's entering that kind of space and what then you gather from there, which stays with you as a human being and comes through in your music, is something which has been referred to um, being, uh, you know, of a very special nature. You know? And when you have your 40 day we ask, do you have a, a structure or a plan to those 40 days? The, the, the thing about this is that, uh, you know, and this is where the mantra Mantra recitation, or mantra is a small little syllable, uh, you know, word. And you're just repeating that hundreds and hundreds of times you're repeating it, either mentally or, you know, whispering or loud. Now, what happens is that as you do that, as you do that, as you do that, it almost that mantra takes on a very special power or energy. A musician's mantra is a chosen phrase. It could be a scale, or it could be a larger, longer scale, or it could actually be a smaller phrase or something, or you know anything. But the point is, doing that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, that it gathers something very special. You know, we 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 mentally might know the phrases. 
um, you know, we are aware of that in any culture, you can recognize those. But when a maestro figure who's been through that rigor of riyaz, they play that, you recognize that, but it hits you. It, it kind of goes <laughs> much deeper, you know. And this is what, you know, this association that the more you churn, and this churning is very good example. You know, if you're, but, you're making butter, you churn. Mm. And the more you churn, the better butter comes out. So when you were a teenager with your dad, mm. what were the practice expectations? Uh, uh, how much were you playing in a day, uh, on a daily basis, as an apprentice? I think it, uh, it, it as I went, uh, I had no idea. In the early days, my capacity to play what I could play was limited. So, but as I improved, as I saw, uh, I saw the biggest uh, influence was once uh, visiting Calcutta with my Ustad, my teacher, his uh, brother's son, Ustad Nishat Khan, who's a phenomenal player, um, asked me to, to give him company. He says, oh, you know, come and sit. I'm going to do my riyas. And he sat at 10 o'clock at night till 6 in the morning did not even get to the go to the, go, to the loo, the toilet. He just played and played and played. And I had never seen something like that. And I'm just watching that. I'm kind of going like that because, you know, sleep is hitting you and all that. But what I experienced was that what do they do? What does that Riyaz actually entail? And that is what, when you saw that, first time I, when I came home, for a break, I said, oh, I'm going to do that because first they inspired you, they showed you that's how it's done. And I I tried. I did not last 40 days, to be very honest, or I did 20 <laughs> days. And that stuck with me all my life. That whatever I achieved is, is actually kept me going. So when you were beginning, was practiced little and often? And then as yeah. you as you progressed, you were able to last longer times and you had the imagination and the vision to... It was haphazard. In the beginning, it was just haphazard. You know, as a kid, you go and you, you know, you, you play football or whatever, cricket, and come and just sit down, then bang it 15, 20 minutes and go, you know, that kind of... But it was only, you know, in those kind of atmospheres and to see the stories they're telling us and all of that, that you begin to 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 see ins, be inspired. So the inspiration, people you respect. Absolutely, the, the the inspiration is the biggest thing. And sometimes what they teach you in content is not a lot, but this is what you get it. And this is where the the other notion that the guru teacher is within us. Each one of us have got our own guides just sitting there. You have to just allow that to come out. Mm -hmm. And you know, so so what's happening by that repetitive practice and all that is your ear, your musical sense, your rhythm sense, everything is being enhanced, right? So then whatever your teacher or great musicians of the time have actually played or we go to concerts and we hear, all of that is going into your system as learning, as, as content, you know? So the accumulation of that is not spoon-fed into you, but this sense of riyas and kind of bringing oomph into your playing and then capacity to, to digest. That's the spiritual and the emotional yeah. fulfillment. So then, you know, that's a lifelong thing, never yes. ends. So at some point you came to the UK and you began teaching and your reputation as a teacher built um, and not just your reputation of, of teaching um, Indian culture, but connecting Indian culture with Western culture or Western instruments. Tell us a bit about that journey. <laughs> I guess I, you know, this is where sometimes, uh, you, you know, you, you realize that actually, you know, I, you can't plan things, but somehow pathways get created and you kind of just flow into that and I never ever imagined I never had a teaching qualification I never learned actually 
uh, you know, they were, this is how, what, what is done in teaching, you make lesson plans and you make schemes of work and all of that, which later on, of course, I have to deal with. Uh, but the, the, the love and passion for music, which was instilled, you know, naturally I came with that background to England. Um, again, you know, what do I do here in a new country? Um, though I, I studied in a, in a convent school in India which, with, with English as a, my medium, uh, but, but the accents here and the whole thing was so different. So gradually, you know, I start and life is, a, is an experiment to say, what do I do? Uh, never imagined music would actually be my living here, but but I knew that music was going to be a big part of me, and I, uh, you know, luckily got invitations to play small gatherings and small concerts here and there, but at the same time I I was, you know, I thought I'll take up a training course in uh, in some engineering or machining because my family backgrounds were engineers. And I tried that six months and I realized that was not for me. Uh, my body was not that strong, you know, or my mind, mind I, I would be shattered by the time evening and, and I couldn't think music, couldn't think anything. And then uh, luckily I got, got a job in Nottingham as a manager for an Indian community center. And apparently they had seen me in a concert and, and I think they must have seen that oh this guy can bring a bit of culture to our center and they hired me for that. And that was my what you call a, a, a quick route into learning about the, the way of life here, the infrastructures here, the council, the funding systems and this and that because I was you know attending committees, meetings, representing the community on various committees and all that, that I, I began to pick up. And then it wasn't until uh, three years on from that, um, Peter Fletcher, who was the the, the, the music, uh, what you call principal music advisor for Leicestershire, was looking at expanding his peripatetic music service to include some Indian music and, and dance. And he approached me, came to see me in Nottingham and literally uh, offered me the job. And, uh, you know, I, I, I took it up. Um, um, and uh, after that, I think that that's the, the beginning where, you know, I was in music, teaching, um, full-time teaching, peripatetic, you know, picking up youngsters from right beginning into schools. You know, we were all new, take my sitar, you know, gather a few youngsters and primary school kids and play them some notes and say, who wants to learn? And they will all have their hands up. <laughs> so how do I do now? Then I kind of thought about a simple, you know, checking with their musicality. And if I felt, oh, you know, these ones would actually add something, I would start teaching them. And that kind of led to, you know, for, and we would, uh, my work here was about eight years of that kind of work and then I, I decided that oh you know in order to really progress I can't stay all my life within teaching at that kind of level so I did a, a master's at School of Oriental African Studies and they used to have a, a program called uh, South Asian Studies um, and in that course, they, they had a, uh, what you call the major in North Indian music with two minor subjects, you know, and I did that. And that is where my, you know, ac ac academic kind of insight into uh, the studies which have been done outside India by ethnomusicologists, particularly looking at Indian musical practices, both North and South Indian. I picked up a lot of vocabulary, which by that time had been become part of the English language, dealing with the uh, what you call the subtleties and dealing with the, the, the very finer aspects of the, this music. Because before that, I guess 
the terminology was not it was totally rooted in the Indian languages and Sanskrit really, which was the mother language of most North Indian languages. So that was was a, a truly you know a, something. And while before that, I remember you know started <laughs> learning classical guitar, um, the nylon string guitar from a teacher in Nottingham, just just to be able to. You know, if I ever go and I'm sitting, you know, amongst musicians, I could relate to what they were talking about, where they were coming from. You know, I did, I think I must say I got to about grade six or grade five or six, you know. Uh, and that developed, um, you know, naturally a little bit of an insight, not, not to any advanced level. Uh, but then I, I was part of a group called Shiva Nova um, and they used to interact with musicians from around the world playing um, with different instruments, composing music for cross-cultural kind of idioms. And I had a great opportunity to play with, the, for example, the Western um, sort of contemporary music which was quite a, you know, a shock to me because sometimes uh, with the atonal stuff going on, there was no tonal center as such. And I would sit there, you know, totally not knowing what's going on. But I stuck until I began to see that what were they trying to do? There was something there which maybe I wasn't recognizing and getting used to this you know different um, way of making music and experiments being done to to somehow bring them together onto some some commonality i played with the uh, jazz idioms i played with the uh, very contemporary western idioms i played with uh, the kora the west african i played with the chinese musicians so that platform allowed me a lot of this learning about the the what britain truly had to offer uh, there are very few places in the world a small island a small place where i if i'm not wrong you can find a musician here from every part of the world if only you you really want to find them and make friends with them they, they could be just your neighbors you know and that is the 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 awesome uh, part of, of this country, you know. And the other awesome thing for you must be that many of your pupils have really blossomed professionally themselves and to see people that you've nurtured become professionals. And what, what was interesting, Robin, was that though I was not working with the, the Guru Shisha model anymore, mm -hmm. but Surely the, the common element was there that in the peripatetic music world, I had contact with the student right from the age of seven or eight. And I saw that through until they went for their A-levels. And, 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 you know, and that bond uh, which got really created and the ones who, who really showed great promise and took on, they went to do their degrees, but when they experienced that, did some bit of work here and there and realized that now music is something which really truly is what they want to do. They still have relationship with me uh, almost I can say as the same as the Guru Shishya model. Yeah. And, and they come, they show utmost respect and as I progress, they progress but at the same time there is, you know, they come and question and say, oh, you know, can you please uh, uh, show us uh, this rag uh, we want to learn? Because they are also sort of hearing us and if they can't understand some subtleties, all want to double check with me. So this guidance <laughs> goes on, you know, so it's a lifelong relationship. But then there are many who, were, who, who, who went and did whatever they did. Music remains part of their life, you know, they play, play, but not as a profession. So if you had to pick one highlight of your journey or your career or a particular moment, what would that one moment be for you? Mm -hmm. 
I think when I I was going through all this and uh, you know I was adjudicating Croydon Music Festival uh, in in Croydon in London that I saw talent youngsters from North India from South Indian tradition play music play so well that I I I said these guys are all hidden we don't even know they exist i must do something in which you know they are visible and i kind of shared this idea that i you know i, I wish that we had a platform and ensemble where all these talented youngsters could come and perform together it'd be a great uh, sight as well a stage full of colorful instruments colorful dresses and such a diversity uh, and somehow music which was arranged and composed bringing out the best of what these people brought that idea you know took took shape and you know was the uh, the the what you call the birth of uh, samyo the south asian music youth orchestra the first performance of that when i saw these youngsters perform and and what it did to the audience a standing ovation never seen before all british youngsters and they played so well i think that was quite touching you know um and the orchestra still carries on um, milab fest another organization in liverpool is looking after that so that i, I could definitely say <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing your wonderful memory and your amazing journey. Thank you very much. You're welcome.